Hello, I'm Carol Patry. I'm the project director for the Federal Interpreter Training Grant awarded to the Department of Linguistics and Interpreting at Gallaudet University by the United States Department of Education Rehabilitation Services Administration. Our service area is RSA Region 3. However, with Gallaudet's portion of the money, we make studio quality videotapes that can be used throughout the nation. The following tape is con consists solely of monologues. If you're interested in tapes which deal with dialogic material, please contact us because we have other tapes that you could use for that purpose. Here are some of the ideas that you can use with this tape. It can be used for pre-interpreting skills. Pre-interpreting skills include outlining, paraphrasing, and shadowing. By outlining, we mean that the student could listen or watch the tape and then list the main ideas and supporting ideas. By paraphrasing, we mean watch the main text or the source text and restate it with other lexical items but preserving the same meaning. And by shadowing we mean that the student or practicing interpreter is asked to repeat exactly what the source message is. However, they start slightly after the source message, message begins, that is maybe three seconds up to perhaps 30 seconds delay. Uh, shadowing is a very good predictor of interpreting skills. Other things that can be added to shadowing are dual tasking, which that means that a student could be asked to do a separate task, such as counting backwards from 100 while shadowing. Uh, dual tasking is very important because interpreters must attend to more than one idea unit at a time. Another way that these tapes can be used is for practice with simultaneous interpretation as well as relay interpretation. We hope that you will enjoy the use of this tape. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Johnson. I'm the chairman of the Department of Linguistics and Interpreting at Gallaudet. Today I'm going to be talking about a topic that is not directly related to my work or to deafness, but which is related to my favorite avocation in life, which is fly fishing. Uh, this may seem like a strange topic uh, for a more or less technical discussion, but in fact, fly fishing is a combination of art, technology, and natural history. And in order to do it well, one must uh, be acquainted with all three of these things. I've been fly fishing since I was seven years old, and uh, it's uh, become a part of my life that means a great deal to me. Every summer I need to get to Yellowstone Park where there are nice trout streams. I need to catch fish and I need to let them go. I will explain all of that as we go along. The first thing that one must understand about fly fishing is that it's not fishing in the sense of looking for meat. If I want to eat a trout, I can go to Safeway and pick one out of a tank with a net, and it will cost me a lot less money than if I were to eat one of the trout that I catch in Yellowstone. I estimate the cost of the trout that I catch in Yellowstone at $75 a pound, and that's why I need to let them go, because I can't afford to eat meat that costs $75 a pound. Uh, the art of fly fishing uh, has to do with an appreciation of nature and an ability to learn enough about the behavior of an ecology that you can a rather smart, cold-blooded animal think that it's getting a free meal. Uh, this involves tricking it with a lure that we call a fly. We call it a fly because it looks like an insect. Now, to understand why that's important, you need to understand something about the ecology of a trout stream. Fish, w a trout in particular, will only live in a particular kind of water where there's a particular kind of feed. And the feed that they prefer are very small insects, aquatic insects, which have a rather interesting lifestyle. They, of course, hatch from eggs like all insects do, but their parents had laid the eggs on the surface of the trout stream. The eggs sink to the bottom and begin to... Uh, begin to grow. The insect will go through four stages before it dies. The first stage is called a nymph stage, N-Y-M-P-H. 
at this stage, uh, the insect looks a lot like a cockroach, but it lives under the water. It has gills and can breathe under the water. And it lives there for roughly a year. Uh, the fish love nymphs, but, and, and they probably compose about 80% of a trout's diet. So that means that the trout eat a lot of food from the bottom. At a particular day that's biologically determined by a clock in the trout, the nymph begins to, or the insect begins to shed its shell, and it swims to the surface of the water. This stage we call an emerger. It sits for a moment on the surface of the water, floating along and looking very desirable to a trout, because now it's come out from under its rock and it's easier to get at. And within moments, it crawls out of its exoskeleton and becomes a different looking insect. Now it's a beautiful long insect with long tail and upright wings that uh, are almost transparent. But because it's wet and because it's just transposed from a water breathing animal to an air breathing animal, it needs to sit on the surface of the water for a moment. At this stage, we call it a dun, D-U-N-N. And it, as I say, it looks entirely different from the nymphal stage. So it sits on the water for a minute, drying its wings, and then it flies into the air where it lives for one day. During that day, it has a flurry of sexual activity because all of the, its other friends who hatched on that same day are out looking for the same kind of activity. Uh, something like a disco bar. Uh, so th they do what they do in the air, and uh, then they return to the water to lay their eggs. The females come back to lay their eggs. The males spend themselves, as it were, and uh, die on the water. That kind of reduces the desirability of that particular lifestyle. Uh, the females come back, sit on the water, and drop their eggs and the eggs go down into the water, and exactly one year later to the day, the eggs will hatch and the cycle will repeat. Now, this is what trout eat. A good-sized trout will eat 2,300 bugs a day. But the trick is to figure out how to make your lure look like what they're eating. So you have to understand a lot about the trout, too. You need to understand water conditions, times of day that cause them to do it. And for some reason, all the trout in the stream decide to eat the same stage of insect at the same st and the same species. In a good trout stream, there will be 30 or 40 different species of these bugs. And all the fish will only be eating one stage of one species at one moment. So this is why I say that you have to know something about natural history. The technology of it comes in how you're going to present the food information to the fish. And first, you have to prepare yourself. To do this, you get into your waders, which are a lot like the bunny suit that you used to wear when you were a kid to sleep in. It's a thick piece of neoprene, about a half an inch thick. And you roll it on, and it comes up to here. It has little suspenders to keep it up. It's, very, it's body tight so that if you fall into the water on the slick rocks, it won't fill with water and, and uh, drown you. In fact, it's, it's somewhat buoyant, so you might just float down the stream and go over the waterfall instead of drowning. Uh, you, over the booties of the waders, you wear heavy boots, canvas boots, uh, which have felt on the sole so that you won't slip on the slick rocks. So that's the, that's the basis of it. This keeps you dry and warm, because the trout streams are quite cold. On the top, you wear a fishing vest, which is kind of the, the uh, central stores of a fisherman. A fishing vest has pockets all over it, maybe 15 or 20 pockets, depending on how much money you're willing to spend. And in each pocket, you keep a, a, a different tool for your fly fishing. And then, of course, you have the fishing pole. Now, the fishing pole for fly fishing is one in which the uh, reel, the part that winds up the line, does not do very much work. 
And that's because when you're fly fishing, the only way that you can present uh, an, an artificial insect to the trout is with a rather heavy line. So what you do is you take a pole that's nine feet long, formerly made of bamboo, now made of various kinds of composite carbonates, uh, costing a good deal of money because of the high technology. Uh, you take your long pole and you put out 30 or 40 feet of line, and it's a rather heavy line. And then you wave the line in the air so that you can get it where you want. This is not the kind of fishing where you just do one cast and it goes where you want. You have to hold the line up in the air by waving your pole back and forth. And then when it's time, when you see where you want to lay the fly, then you put your arm out and the line snakes forward, lays out in a very flat line on the water, and the fly will drift for 20 or 30 feet if you're very good at it without any pull from the line. Uh, so that's the technology of it. On the other end of the line is a very thin piece of monofilament nylon. Actually, it's a tapered piece. It goes from uh, about the width of a piece of sewing thread down to the width of a spider web. And it will break at about one and a half pounds of, of uh, tension. You can catch a five pound or 10 pound fish on that because the pole is also flexible and acts like a shock absorber. So you have a nine foot piece of monofilament so that the fish cannot see the line attached to the fly. And then on the very end, you have what we call a fly. And that's where most of the art comes in. In order to create a fly, you take a hook, which of course is a, a round uh, bent piece of metal. Now, as we do it, we use hooks without barbs. Most hooks that you've seen have a shank, a long piece, and a curve, which we call a bend, and then a point. And immediately behind the point, there's what we call a barb, which is the backwards hook that keeps the hook from coming out of the trout's mouth. But if your goal is to let the trout go to preserve a piece of the ecology, then you use a hook without the barb. The uh, flies that we use are exactly the size of an insect, which are very small. They're smaller than the width of my little finger. Uh, and they're made of this hook as its basis and then uh, thread, feathers, and yarn wound around the, the shank of the hook so that they imitate the image of a fly. There are, as far as I know, there are probably two different, 2,000 different kinds of trout fly, each one designed to look like a different stage of a different species of insect. And uh, they're beautiful to look at, nice to collect, and each has its own name. One of the classics is the Royal Coachman, which is a lovely fly. Uh, it's made with its tail, is made of the hackle feathers of a fighting cock. Then the next uh, little stage of it is called a hurl, H-E-R-L, which is made of a single feather from a peacock plume and it's wrapped around the, the, uh, the shank of the hook so that it spreads out and fans out around and makes a hurl. And then there's some bright red uh, floss, scarlet red floss, another peacock hurl, two wings made from matching quills from a wood duck, little tiny wings that stick up, and then what we call a hackle, which again is made from the neck feathers of a fighting cock but it's tied in such a way that you tie the end of it in and then you wrap it around and it too fans out. And that's what makes the fly float on the water. It also makes the trout think that it's a fly uh, or an insect flapping its wings. It gives the impression of very rapid movement. Uh, and then there's a head which is made of thread and uh, all tied with special hooks. I'm sorry, with special knots. So. Uh, you can see that this is a complex thing. This is not sitting on a river bank. Uh, this is not the definition of uh, fishing that we ordinarily think of, which is a jerk on one end of the line waiting for a jerk on the other. This is a, a kind of art that it takes a lifetime to practice. It's something that uh, involves as much work off the water as it does on the water. And it's something that involves uh, an enjoyment and knowledge of nature 
that's unavailable in any other kind of activity that I know. Hi, my name is Leslie Rock. I'd like to talk today about vegetarianism. More specifically, I'll talk about why I decided to become a vegetarian. Meat eaters or carnivores commonly do one of two things to avoid the guilt they might have involved with consuming meat products. First, they might deny the fact that eating meat does indeed harm animals and degrades the life of animals. Second, they might rationalize. This is pretty common. They might realize that eating animals does indeed deprive them of the quality of their life, but they might decide that, well, it has such high nutritional value that it's really it's necessary. It's just an absolute necessity, and they don't know what they would do without it. So despite the fact that it might not be the ethical thing to do, health-wise, it's pretty much their only option. I'll talk about both of these things. It will involve two main reasons why I became a vegetarian. First of all, there are ethical concerns. My reasons, ethically, um, range from the very, very obvious, people might be aware of them immediately, to the not so obvious and sometimes pretty hidden. I mean, you have to give it some serious thought to, to come up with these reasons or to realize that what you're doing might not be the best thing for all concerned, including other animals besides humans. First of all, a very, very obvious example of some of the ethical problems with eating meat is veal. A few years ago, people started to become more and more aware of the fact that although veal is a tender, delicious meat that is, it isn't tough, it doesn't have any muscle quality whatsoever, um, they might not be of the, aware of the fact that what it requires to become a veal calf is quite less than a high quality of life. Um, Veal calves are kept in very small pens. You've probably seen pictures of this in magazines. They're kept in these small pens by farmers, but important to realize is not that the farmer does this just because he doesn't have enough space for these veal calves. He does it because there's a demand for white meat, and the demand for white meat, which comes from beef, and it sounds ironic, but it can be done. What farmers do is they keep them, like I said, in these very small pens where they're unable to move around. This keeps them from developing muscle tone, which would be tough in the form of steak. So it keeps, it's, aesthetically, it's a nice thing to do for people who enjoy nice white meat. What they also do to make the meat white is they keep the cows anemic. And in order to do this, they have to be fed a diet which is completely deficient of iron. Everyone knows that anemia in humans or in animals is not something to normally strive for. Um, humans who have iron deficiencies take iron supplements. So, and also it's important to remember that there's no reason um, nutritionally that people should eat meat that is lacking in iron. It's simply aesthetics. People like the look and the taste of veal. Like I said, people are becoming more aware of the fact that eating veal might not be the best thing to do ethically. So a lot of people have cut it out of their diets. A lot of people who still might be quite willing to eat beef are even boycotting veal and are speaking out against it. This presumes that the life of a cow raised for cattle is better than the life of a veal calf. This may or may not be true. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about cows raised for cattle, beef. First of all, you know, we have supply and demand laws in this country, and it's, it's pretty obvious. If a, if a farmer can make more money by having 40 cows than he can having 20 cows, he'd want to have 40 cows. But in the U.S., there's not that much farmland available. There are more and more people gobbling up more and more land, and so the farmland is actually being reduced while we have a greater demand for beef. So what farmers do is they have those 40 cows on a smaller amount of land than what they would have had before. Um, the laws of supply and demand also affect the quality of life of the cows in terms of what they're fed. If you can feed 40 cows um, or feed 20 cows, you would want to feed 40 cows, even if this requires using the same amount of grain. And most of you probably know about what you can do to supplement a diet. There are steroids, there are other chemicals that can be injected or added to cow's foods with 
without their permission, of course, and to aid in their growing and maturation so that they can quickly be sent off to slaughter. You don't want a cow staying around for a long time. You want it to mature and get off to the slaughterhouse as quickly as possible. So he consumes less and less of your um, grain or whatever it is that you're feeding him. Okay. Another thing about beef or cows raised for cattle is that the quality of their life, as I mentioned, is, is pretty awful. And up until the last day, it's, it stays about the same. And the last day of their life is actually the worst day of all. Not only are they slaughtered, but the last day of their life, they aren't fed at all. In fact, they're not fed for about two days up to the point of their slaughter because it's a waste of grain. The food doesn't move from their intestinal tract um, onto their body and produce more meat for about two days. So there's no point in feeding them. Why should you feed this cow and then slaughter it with grain in its stomach? So what they do is they starve them for the two days prior to their death. Again, this is, it, it's in keeping with the rest of their life, but it seems unduly harsh. The third thing I'll talk about is chicken. While most Americans have cut out red meat, most Americans have not cut out eating white meat, and this includes chicken and other poultry. Since the, the demand for chicken has grown so much over the past few years, and like I said, land for, for farming and, and livestock hasn't increased, farmers have to deal with that. So they pack more and more chickens onto less and less land. Presumably, their profits would be growing, so they would have more money to feed these chickens, but they don't feed the chickens individually. They feed them in group, so there becomes intense and fierce competition for food. If you put down however much grain you're going to put down to feed your chickens, and then it's a free-for-all, well, you can imagine if some of them aren't getting the food and nutrients they need, it's like any other animal with competition. They become quite violent. Um, so much to the point that often they peck at each other until the other one's death. And that, of course, presents a major problem for farmers who are raising chickens in mass. They want as many chickens as they can possibly get. And if they're killing each other, it doesn't do the farmer any good. And certainly doesn't do the meat consumer any good because prices will go up. So what farmers do routinely to combat this is, um, is a, something called debeaking. It's rather cruel. They cut the chicken's beak off right at the, at the base so that the chickens can't peck at each other. And that's a fact. That's something that they do. It certainly solves the problem of them pecking at each other, and it seems in the farmer's eyes to have solved the problem entirely. However, it's quite painful for the chickens. Okay, the fourth thing I'll talk about, I've covered veal, beef, and chicken, and this is a more, like I was mentioning, some of the forms of um, carnivorism are more subtle than others. Um, the fourth category is animal products which are not eating the flesh of animals, like drinking milk from a dairy cow or eating eggs from a hen. Okay, um, simple biology tells us that only half of all chickens or cows born for this purpose will be able to be used. That is, only female chickens can lay eggs and only female cows can produce milk. So what happens to the other half? Well, I doubt that they're allowed to go free. I mean, they're perfectly viable sources of an animal product for human consumption. So the male cows are, are raised and fed for beef, and the female chickens, I mean the male chickens, sorry, are raised to be um, poultry. So you can see that just by eating, chi by eating chicken eggs and by drinking milk, you're still contributing to um, the degradation of the life of animals. Okay, so that pretty much covers the ethical reasons why I don't eat meat. And actually, I should point out that that was really the reason why I stopped eating meat in the first place. But since I have stopped, I've noticed considerable health benefits, which I think are worth mentioning. First of all, meat and poultry contain a lot more fat and a lot more cholesterol per ounce than do vegetables and grains. Seems pretty straightforward, but at this time, most doctors are advising that people eat less fat and eat less cholesterol and reduce their cholesterol levels. A simple way to do this is to become a vegetarian and with no ill health effects that I've observed so far. Also, when you cut out eating meat, you don't fill up as fast and you have more room, more appetite for some of the good things, such as fiber. Now, when you stop eating fat and you start eating more fiber, it seems that the net effect would be much greater than 
just cutting out one or increasing the other. So what happens when you become a vegetarian is you, you cut out the fat and you consume more fiber. You actually have the same appetite as before, but it takes a lot of vegetables to produce that full effect that you would get from meat. So you're able to eat a lot more and a lot more good things at a lower calorie cost. Also, I should mention that um, if you have a potato, which weighs about 10 ounces, for example, and you have a 10-ounce steak, you have to take into consideration the calories, not just the ounces. So you can't measure just strictly ounce for ounce. So that 10-ounce steak might have, say, 350 calories, maybe more. The potato, 90 calories. So you could really, presumably, you could eat four potatoes. Not saying anyone would, but just to measure things calorically is more important than to measure ounce for ounce. You could also supplement by eating other vegetables, which is what you should do, in fact. You shouldn't just eat four potatoes. The last thing that I'd like to talk about is protein concerns. This is every time I tell someone I'm a vegetarian, they say, how do you get enough protein? And I'm sure I don't look like I'm lacking protein or lacking any other vitamin or mineral, but this is just something that people always say. They feel like it's practically the only thing you can say when someone says they're a vegetarian is how do you get enough protein? And really, I'm sure if I ask those people where they're getting their vitamin A or their calcium or their vitamin E, they wouldn't be able to tell me. It's just that protein has taken on this life of its own. It's become the most important um, vitamin or mineral out there so that when someone cuts it out, there's all this hoopla. People have written books about complementary proteins, getting complex carbohydrates. If you miss one of your eight amino acids, none of the other seven work, all of this stuff. In actuality, it's pretty much a myth. It's true that you need to have protein, but it's not true that you need meat to have protein. You can get protein from a variety of sources. Some of the well-known sources are nuts, grains, and beans. Um, some of the other sources, which are not so well known, are things, vegetables, like the potato is very high in protein. Um, it, the one problem with being a vegetarian is that often it's difficult to get enough calories, which for some people may or may not pose a problem. It's difficult to eat all vegetables and not fill up and still at the same time get whatever it is, your 2,000 calories, to give you enough energy for the day. This usually just it only takes time. As soon as the effects of the fiber start to wear off, you get more and more used to eating larger quantities of vegetables. Um, the last thing I'd like to talk about, it doesn't fall into the category of health or ethical concerns, but I'll mention it just briefly, is ecological concerns. As I mentioned, the population of the earth is increasing every day, farmland is decreasing, and we're feeding all of this grain to cows and chickens. At the same time, people in third world countries and even in the United States are starving because they don't have this grain. It's not to say that if we stopped feeding the grain to cows and chickens that suddenly these people would not be starving, but in the terms of global ecology, it's important to remember that really people with more money consume more meat and have better health, not because they eat more meat, but because they can pick and choose from the grains that they eat from as well. But if people were to stop eating meat, it certainly our world resources would be distributed more equitably and more evenly, resulting in probably less starvation. So that's it. That's all I'll talk about today. And I would just like to say that I've suffered no ill health effects for the two years that I've been a vegetarian. Thank you. I'm Ben Kelly, and I'm with a group called the Institute for Injury Reduction. And our work uh, is directed just at what our name implies, and that is trying to reduce uh, not uh, all kinds of injuries, but the biggest component of injuries, which are those caused by unsafe products. I'm going to talk to you this morning or today, at whatever time it is you're looking at this tape, uh, about some unsafe products that uh, you are very commonly uh, associated with, and all of us in society are, but we may not be aware of. Uh, but first, let me give you a little bit of the cultural and the uh, historical background to how we think about injuries in our society and why it has really taken us so very long to get a good handle on ways to reduce injuries. Uh, if you look back into Deuteronomy, the Old Testament laws, you'll find one law that says, uh, very interestingly, that when you build your house, and keep in mind that 
Uh, this was directed at folks living in the Mediterranean in Old Testament times where everybody uh, slept on the roof at night in order to keep cool. So the law was that when you build your house, you are to build around the roof a parapet so that when your sleeping guest rolls around in his or her sleep, uh, the guests do not fall off the roof and be hurt or killed and bring the blood and the guilt of their injury onto your head. In other words, to put it in modern terms, when you make something that may hurt somebody, do your best in the design of that product to prevent that injury from occurring. Uh, but that, as it turns out, is a very, very new concept in our society. Uh, historically and theologically, uh, blame has been placed uh, on victims for their illness and for their injury. And I think you can, can probably think of many examples of bad people being the alleged explanation for illness and, and disease and for injury. Uh, lepers uh, were traditionally thought to be victims of, of, of God's uh, ill will because they had done something wrong. Sick people through the ages have been treated with a mixture of good science and bad folklore uh, and bad theology. The judgments about the victims of injury uh, and their responsibility for their own acts began to abate in the 18th and 19th centuries, and now basically we have a modern approach to, uh, to illness uh, and to injury that says uh, we're not interested in finding out uh, whether it was bad acts that caused uh, uh, human impairment. We're interested in stopping that impairment. But we still do have touches of that in our society, and I'll, I'll come back to the, the main theme in a moment. But one of those is, and we see it every day, in society's initial reaction to AIDS, uh, which has been a reaction of blaming people for supposedly bad behavior that got them in contact with the, the microorganism that causes the disease, rather than going about the much more important job of finding ways to eradicate the microorganism or protect the human body when it comes in contact so that it doesn't get that particular uh, very deadly virus. These same concepts apply to injury, and these same failings have applied to injury, uh, and uh, probably can be summed up by such expressions as, well, those stupid teenagers, look how, look how they drove. You know, well, those, those drunken kids, they got in that car, and what can you expect? Uh, or, well, that guy was driving too fast, and that's why he hit the rear end of that other car, and that's what caused the fire. The fact of the matter is that the, the causes of the events that can produce injury and the causes of the injury are very, very different. And let's go back to the automobile, which is, is where uh, I wanted to uh, uh, start and what I want to talk with you about a little bit about the systems that are designed to protect us and sometimes that unfortunately hurt us in the modern automobile that we come into contact with every time we get into a car uh, and take for granted and really don't think about. Uh, one of those systems is the seatbelt system. Now, 20 years ago, seatbelts were an oddity in the United States. They were just coming into popular use in Europe and Australia, and uh, there was great resistance on the part both of users and of manufacturers to providing and making use of seatbelts. Today, uh, we take it for granted that most folks put their seatbelts on because they're required to by law, and that uh, it is correct, as the little placard often says on the side of the car, that if you buckle up, you'll be safe. Uh, seat belts give us a very good and sometimes frightening lesson of, of just how injury reduction can work or not work. And let me give you some examples in the seat belt systems that we all come in contact with today. When you get into your car, you are getting into a product that inherently has a tremendous amount of energy built into it and which at any time, although we don't think of this as we're driving happily or grumpily along the roads, at any time can turn on you in a crash situation, very often one over which the driver has no control, and become a, uh, a discharger of highly lethal energy. And this happens in a matter of literally thousands of a second. In those thousands of a second, there is virtually nothing that the occupant or the driver can do to control the injury. The decisions as to whether those injuries will happen or not happen have already been made in advance by the manufacturer of the product. And those decisions will determine what kind of a safety belt is in the car or what kind of a restraint system. Modern cars are equipped with airbags, and I'll talk about those a little bit in a moment. 
and how well that car will manage the forces of the crash so that those forces uh, are attenuated and kept away from the occupant as effectively as possible. Let's f uh, go into our heads and, and go off and be driving down the road for a moment in, in some different kinds of cars. And, and I'll play the game of switching seatbelt systems around, and you can kind of follow along and imagine that with me. Uh, let's say we're in the standard American car made between, say, 1975 and 1990, and we're in the front seat. And I'm the driver, and you're the passenger. We are wearing what is called a three-point manual lap shoulder belt, basically a very good system. It is a single belt or a, or, a, or a lap and shoulder belt connected together that comes across the body and buckles over here on this side and is fastened to the car so that when there is a crash, the retractor of this belt, the spool that keeps it uh, snug against us, locks up. The belt restrains our bodies from moving forward or being thrown out of the car and uh, does a good job of, of restraining us. Uh, that's a good system but it can be eroded and has been eroded in many cars of American manufacture. If now we're in a car made, say, by General Motors uh, during much of that same period, unfortunately, the shoulder portion of the belt in which we're, which we're now using may be loose. And it may be loose because the manufacturer has put a device in the, in the belt to make it loose so that we'll be more comfortable. We haven't been told, unfortunately, that that looseness, once a crash occurs, can turn against us and defeat the very purpose of the belt, which is to hold us tightly in place. So we want to determine that the, the belt that we're using doesn't have looseness in it and hasn't been designed so that it will defeat that purpose. Now, why in the world would a manufacturer put a device in a, in a belt to make it loose when tightness is what we need? The answer is that many manufacturers, due to their lack of concern with safety, have placed the anchorage points of their shoulder belts so that for many, many people of other than average size, the belt fits uncomfortably. The neck, if you're short, uh, it may come across the face of a child. Their choice has been to either do a better job in designing that belt so that it will fit you better and be placed better, uh, one way of doing that, by the way, is an adjustable anchorage point, a point that actu actually allows you to move the shoulder belt up and down. But the cheap, quick, dirty, and dangerous way is to simply say to you, you can put some slack into this belt, then it will fit you, then it won't come across your neck uncomfortably, but in a crash, it, uh, its performance will be seriously degraded. So that's one example of a good safety objective, the good old standard three-point lap shoulder belt, that has been eroded uh, by manufacturer indifference. Another belt that uh, we strongly recommend people watch out for and avoid if at all possible, and particularly for children, is the lap-only belt in the rear seats of most cars. Uh, imagine now that we're sitting in the back seat of a car and we're wearing a lap belt. That is a belt that only goes around the waist and a frontal crash has occurred. Uh, our bodies now are being flung forward against this belt. All of the force of the crash is being localized and concentrated at this very vulnerable spot on the body, uh, which is the midriff. And a number of terrible things can happen as a result, uh, as a result of our not having a shoulder belt to restrain the upper torso. One is that heads will fling forward, and heads can impact the floor, the knees, or the interior of the car. Uh, with serious brain damage, and this is a common cause of brain damage. Uh, another is that the abdominal organs can, can be traumatized, and there can be uh, death from internal bleeding or very serious permanent injury, such as permanent colostomies. A, a final and very common and tragic outcome is that the spinal cord can be damaged, with resulting paraplegia or, or lower level uh, a quadriplegia, depending on where the belt is placed. Very, very belatedly, the manufacturers have begun to equip their new cars with rear seat lap shoulder belts so as to avoid these injuries. And this is particularly imperative, as I've said, for families with children, because children are commonly the, the folks that we put in the back seat. So they are commonly the people who are most exposed uh, to these kinds of injuries. Still, there are 140 million cars on the roads today that do not have shoulder belts in the rear seats, and those cars uh, present highly lethal restraint systems for their occupants. Coming up to today, and the most modern of cars, we find the fleet of cars made since the late uh, 1980s, and particularly since 1990, 
are equipped in their front seats with so-called automatic restraints. Now, all automatic restraints are not the same. And in fact, they, run, run, they range from uh, terribly inadequate and sometimes hazardous systems to very, very effective systems. Uh, I, I will give you the bad news and then end with the good news. The bad news is that these so-called automatic belts, these are belts that supposedly put themselves on you so that you do not have to do the job of buckling up, are in the vast majority of cases designed so that they have very serious safety defects. I will point out two of those to you. One is the design which we are seeing uh, more and more commonly in new, in new cars in which the shoulder belt is attached to the door. It may be attached to the door through a motor. It may be attached to the door at a fixed point. Uh, but the, the central problem is that because it is attached to the door and not to the car, when the door opens in the crash, and doors open in crashes some 12 to 15 percent of the time, suddenly the belt has been removed from the occupant at the very moment when the belt is most needed and nothing is restraining the user and keeping the user inside of the car. So we have an anomaly of goodwill, people of goodwill, safety conscious people, choosing an automatic belt because they think it's better and finding that at the moment that it is most needed, it lets you down. Uh, and this is resulting in uh, well-documented deaths and injuries. And our prediction is that manufacturers eventually, because of litigation, uh, and, and bad publicity are going to be forced to, to stop making these systems. Nonetheless, there are tens of millions of cars out there with these systems today. Uh, the, the other drawback uh, to automatic belt designs is that many of them have a separate lap belt. And users will get into the car, have the automatic shoulder belt come across the body, and completely forget uh, that they must still do this. That is, they must make the motion of buckling up that they've always had to make. Uh, and if they did not, uh, they would be at risk. A shoulder belt alone, and, and if you have this kind of car, I urge you to use the lap belt each time you get in. A shoulder belt alone is one of the most hazardous belt systems imaginable. It has been outlawed in Europe for two decades because of the kinds of injuries that it can do hanging injuries and upper torso injuries, as well as ejections. And it should not be permitted in American cars today. It is a sad commentary on the, the backward state of safety regulation that these systems are even allowed. Uh, those are the bad news uh, sides of the ledger. But let's look at the good news. The good news is that more and more cars are being equipped with airbags. Airbags are inflatable cushions that emerge from the steering wheel or the dashboard or wherever they have been placed by the manufacturer and the designer of the car just at the moment of the crash and catch the body, distributing the force of the crash across the entire body and cushioning it just like a big pillow. Uh, it's encouraging that at long last we are getting airbags in new cars. It is discouraging that it has taken since 1971 when airbag technology was perfected and ready to be installed in new cars to achieve this accomplishment. And we in the, in the injury control field estimate that probably more than 100,000 people have died and more than a half a million have been very, very seriously injured because they did not have airbags during this period when they could have been available. Uh, in sum, uh, I think the, 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 the lesson and the moral of all this is that we are still living if, I, if you would, just at the end of the dark ages of injury reduction and injury control in our society. Technologies exist and concepts exist which could do a great deal to save lives and reduce injuries, whether in motor vehicle crashes, uh, in the use of deadly all-terrain vehicles, in injuries from motorboat propeller blades, in rollos, rollovers of utility vehicles, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. When the day comes that manufacturers are made responsible for making their products safe and we stop blaming the user each time something goes wrong, uh, we will begin to make all the necessary progress to remove injury from its very dubious uh, place as the number one killer of Americans age birth to 50, a place it has occupied for all too long as the most expensive health problem in the nation, costing us well over $50 billion a year. And uh, we will bring this problem under control. Thank you. 
My name is Bob Fish, and I am a real estate broker from Maryland. I'd like to speak with you a little while about the third most stressful event in life. According to psychologists for the National Association of Realtors, the acquisition or disposition of personal property is the third most stressful event in life. It is third only to the death of a family member or divorce. So we're dealing with uh, something that's, uh, that's a pretty serious matter. And for us in the real estate industry, it's, it's very important to know that. We uh, encounter people at a time when they're excited and, and, and they see this process as a lot of fun. And in a very short time, they become another kind of creature that we don't understand. And so it's helpful to realize that this process is the third most stressful event in life. Now, one of the things I'd like to mention to you is the single most important decision that you as a prospective purchaser or seller will make, and that is the real estate agent you choose to represent you. Many times, when you are out to buy a home, you believe that in choosing a real estate agent, you have selected someone who is going to represent you in this transaction. And that can be a primary reason why later on there is a great deal of stress because the real estate agent, unless it is otherwise negotiated, is the representative of the seller. In fact, a real estate agent has a fiduciary responsibility of absolute fidelity to the seller. That's a standard uh, of civil law which is the highest standard of civil law that can be applied in the United States. So the relationship of agency which is the relationship between a real estate agent representing a seller in a transaction is a rather important relationship. Now, when you select an agent to help you find a property, unless you are specifically paying their commission, they are accepting a role of sub-agency with whatever agent has listed the property for sale very important that you understand that as a prospective purchaser because you need to know that if you want specific representation you need to hire it either hire an attorney or hire a real estate agent who is practicing as a buyer broker now I want to cover a term called buyers remorse I think anytime anyone buys anything they'll experience this this feeling this terrible feeling like I've made a mistake and we get uh, a sickness in our stomach there's an adrenaline surge and I'm just absolutely certain I've done the wrong thing I think it's important when we enter this experience of purchasing property that we realize that for most of us it's the most expensive commitment we're going to make in our lifetime and so buyers remorse is more prominent the fact that we have this feeling means that uh, we're normal. It doesn't mean that we've made a mistake. But if no one tells you that and you have this terrible, overwhelming sense of doom, then many times you feel like you've made an error and the process or experience of going through uh, the mortgage application and then uh, the title search and that uh, can really, really make it a stressful experience. I think that uh, uh, what I'm going to do is just sort of outline what happens in the process of acquiring a property. First of all, you make a decision to get involved in the process in the first place. Now, if this is your first time out, if you are what we call a first time home buyer, uh, then I salute you because it's a pretty brave thing to do to come into the marketplace and uh, uh, go and meet with a real estate agent who you're absolutely certain knows everything you don't know and is in a position to take advantage of you. In fact, we are many times seen as little green people with horns whose sole ambition in life is to take your money away. And of course, there's nothing further from the truth. But nevertheless, that is the perception that uh, a buyer carries forward. So if you, it's, we salute you for being brave enough to come into the marketplace. First of all, the process in selecting homes. How do you know when you decide what homes you're going to view or evaluate 
that you are going to see a fair sampling of what's available in the marketplace. When you work with a real estate agent, they have access to a program that's called a multiple listing service. The multiple listing service has all of the available properties in a given area. And a computer printout can be generated. And you can begin this process of looking for homes by eliminating the homes you don't want to evaluate on paper. And that's a fairly simple process. First of all, with your real estate agent, you've determined what price range properties you're going to be able to look at. There's no value in looking at and falling in love with a property that you can't afford to buy. So when you run this computer list for the entire area, you can eliminate those properties which are priced beyond your ability and those properties which are priced below your area of interest. Now that will leave a certain number. Some of these will be five bedrooms, some will be two bedrooms, and you'll have some requirements. Some will have two bathrooms, some will have two and a half and three and so on. And so you're able to eliminate properties on paper and therefore cover hundreds and hundreds of miles in a very few minutes. The other thing that this does is when you've made your selections, if you're driving down the street later on and you pass a property for sale, you don't have to say, well, what about that one? Why didn't we look at that one? You probably did. And we're able to eliminate it. Now, this process will take a great deal of the stress out. The stress is usually produced by the idea that I'm going to make a mistake, that I'm going to do this wrong. I'm going to commit myself to a hundred or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of error. And so, by entering this process of selection, and I want to caution you not to uh, meet a real estate agent at a property and hope that they bring with them two other properties for you to look at. When you decide to get into the market, go to a realtor's office, have them run this sheet for you, and go through this selection process. It takes a little bit of extra time, but it's well worthwhile. There's also another thing that will occur. You'll have an opportunity to decide whether or not you want to work with this agent. In spite of the fact that you are now aware that the agent is going to represent the seller, a certain amount of what they are going to do will have an effect on the smoothness of this transaction. So you want to make certain that whoever you select, you're comfortable with them. That you, you, you have a feeling that they are going to be able to carry out the requirements and the requests that you have, get you the information that you need. That's an important thing. Once you make a decision as to what properties you want to evaluate, as you go to see properties, try and only look at three or four. Beyond that, what happens is we begin to take the fireplace from one property and put it in the living room from another. So as you evaluate properties, eliminate them. That is the purpose, is just to eliminate, no, this one's not right, and go to the next one. Generally, if you take the time to eliminate properties on paper, carefully select the properties that you want to evaluate, most of the time you're able to find the property that's right for you in the first day out. Sometimes it takes two days, but generally speaking, we find that you can actually find the right property for you in one day. That eliminates a lot of stress. Then, once you make an offer, Generally, that offer is carried forward by the real estate agent, and there is some time that occurs while you sit and worry. Now, I'm going to recommend to you, in fact, I'm going to give you, I'm going to become a doctor and give you a prescription for buyer's remorse, because this is the time when buyer's remorse becomes most prevalent. It's right after we sign that contract offer to purchase. So I'm going to recommend that you go to a 7-Eleven store, or a Highs, or the grocery store, and procure a bag of M&Ms. And every time you have that sick feeling way down in the pit of your stomach, what I suggest you do is take two M&Ms and call your real estate agent. Because what is really happening is there's a question that you don't have the answer to. Did I pay too much? Will I be approved for the loan? And the time it takes 
Call your real estate agent. Let the candy help to diffuse the adrenaline, and you'll feel better. You'll also have a little chuckle every time you think about taking two M&Ms and calling your real estate agent. That goes a long way towards helping you to overcome this, this terrible feeling of impending doom. Good luck, and thanks. Hi, my name is Sue Crutchfield, and I'm the coordinator of the Interpreter Training Grant at Gallaudet University. But uh, today I don't want to talk about that. I do want to talk about one of my favorite part-time activities. From about mid-December to March of every year, you can find me most Friday and Saturday nights in old high school gyms filled with loud music and screaming teenagers. You might wonder why I'd want to spend my time in a place like that on the weekends but it's because I'm a pom-pom competition judge and that's where the competitions are happening. I got involved in pom-pom judging a few years ago when I went to a competition with a friend whose daughter was performing uh, with one of the squads. I, I hadn't been to a high school gym in a long time and I certainly had not watched pom-pom since I had been in high school and had been a pom-pom myself and it was, it was really a different experience this time around. As my friend and I sat, waited for the competition to begin, we saw the judges file in. There was a team of six or eight of them, and they looked very professional. And this was definitely different from the kind of judging that I had seen when I was a, uh, affiliated with Pom Pom Squad before. The judges now were all dressed with coordinating outfits. They had name badges and emblems. They're all carrying these uh, big clipboards filled with papers and carrying these large white handbooks. I think one or two of the judges even had one of those handheld mini cassette players. And I thought, hmm, this, this looks like a team of professional judges. Right away, I started thinking about what, you know, what they would be doing. As the competition got underway, I could see that the judges really had their work cut out for them. And indeed, the competition was fierce, and they needed to have qualified judges to be uh, judging the people that were performing. There was maybe 10 or 12 squads performing that night and certainly not all of them were perfect but of the top five or six they were really excellent. I was very impressed with the skill of the individual girls and of the routines that I saw. These were elaborate seven to nine minute routines much more complicated and polished than what I had remembered. Back in my day, we took the competitions very seriously and we did prepare for them vigorously, but we certainly did not perform for seven to nine minutes. And I mean, some of these routines looked choreo choreographed by professionals, and maybe they had been. So um, I could see, like I said, that the judges had their work cut out for them, and I was very interested in getting involved. I couldn't imagine how the judges could determine best squads from among some of these that seemed to me at first glance to be almost perfect. So I got involved as a judge. And I was right, I found that the criteria for judging was a lot different than it had been in my day. Back when I'd started 15 years ago, I think that the judges generally were maybe the high school principal, a math teacher, the PE teacher, a couple of parents, and maybe one former pom-pom captain who might be minimally qualified to do the judging. Uh, obviously there are some problems with that kind of setup because those people are all affiliated with one school and they're not going to be as objective looking at their own school and I mean a math, a math teacher may or may not be qualified to judge a pom-pom competition. Uh, I didn't know what had changed in the time that I had left school but I found out that in 1979 this organization, the Prince George's County Pom-Pom Association was um, set up. Uh, a group of probably former pom-poms, coaches, sponsors, teachers got together and decided that they needed to define the sport more than it had been in the past. What exactly is a pom-pom routine supposed to be like? What is a competition supposed to have happen? What kind of judging category should be looked at? And they worked on that for a long time and came up with this, this handbook that I saw the judges carrying. It's really quite thorough. They've defined the art of pom-poms as uh, m movement to music. So it's not the same as cheerleading where I mean, there's no shouting going on. This is a combination drill team dance routine that we were seeing. 
I found out that to become a judge, you had to go through a training and successfully apprentice each category, and I'll discuss what the categories are in a minute. You had to successfully apprentice each category before becoming qualified in that category. Uh, there's judge, there's a score sheet for each of the categories that's different according to what the category is. It's a carbon copy type of thing, and all of the sheets, a copy of all the sheets goes back to the judge's chairperson, and they particularly look at what the apprentices are, are writing on the sheets, whether the comments are appropriate, whether this person seems qualified to judge that category, and I think that's good. There's some quality control that they hadn't had in the past. Uh, and judges that continue to work year to year, their sheets are still periodically um, looked at by the judge's chairperson because just to make sure that they're still on the right track and that they're making appropriate comments and that they're being objective. Uh, the, let me talk about the, the judging categories now. There are six categories that the judges are looking at and I'll list them and then I'll go over briefly what some of them entail. They are inspection, marching and maneuvering, which we call M&M, precision moves and dance, which I will explain, general effect, routine, and captain. Now the captain cate category is judged separately. There, so I'll talk about that last. But of those other five categories, whichever squad scores the most in the combined five categories is, is the winning squad. Generally they have a trophy for the top three or the top five squads. There is one judge assigned to each category for a competition. So if, if they're having inspection at that competition, there would be six judges. Each judge is only looking at that one particular thing. For example, the inspection judge is not looking at the captain and the um, precision moves and dance judge is not noting uh, the routine. Um, most of the judges that work for the Prince George's County Pom Pom Association are able to judge any number of categories. Some specialize, maybe they might prefer one or two categories over another, but most of them are qualified. I mean, they're considered qualified to judge in all the categories, and they're just hired for a particular category that night. I, for example, don't feel very comfortable judging m and M. I'm not particularly fond of doing inspection. The other categories a lot. And there's some people who do almost all M&M judging because that's what they really like. And they can have it because I'm not very good at that. So I'll start with inspection. Some of the competitions don't have inspections. It's up to the school that's hosting the competition whether they want to have the squads go through this. But probably more than half of them do. Inspection, for the inspection, the squad um, is led into a particular area outside of the gym before they perform. They get into a particular formation and stand at whatever they term attention. For example, the squad might line up all in a row, all 20 or 28 girls, and stand with their pom-poms together looking straight ahead. Whatever the team decides is what they want to do for that five or ten minutes that the inspection is going on. That's the way they have to stay for the entire inspection. So, of course, they want to pick a position that's fairly comfortable because, I mean, they're going to be there for a long time. Back when I was involved, I remember that we, we had this policy of always smiling. We smiled through everything. We smiled through the entire inspection. I think all the squads did that. It was sort of the standard thing. That's pretty much been dropped now. I mean, a squad could. If they decide they want to smile through the whole inspection, then they can hold this you know, very fake frozen smile for 10 minutes. Most of them opt for just an expressionless face looking straight ahead, which is fine. The inspection judge is looking at two things, uniformity and neatness. The uniformity is they're really looking at everything from uniform spacing between the girls, uniform position of feet and hands, uniform eye gaze all in the same direction, as well as um, appearance from head to toe. Basically, each girl has to have the uniform look exactly the same as the other girls, they have to have exactly the same sock, you know, set of socks that they're going to use. The shoes, if they're, you know, white cheerleading shoes or something, have to be exactly the same brand, and they have to be absolutely spotless. So the inspection judge um, carries that clipboard around with the score sheet with a place to, to check off any place where there's a mistake and each mistake that they see in any of those things I've mentioned or you know, any number of other kinds of 
mistakes, uh, the squad is deducted one-tenth of a point. The inspection is worth 20 points and no squad is, is going to get a negative. If they, if they happen to have all of their tick marks checked off and they ended up with a zero, they, they're not going to go into the negative column. I doubt if that would happen. And surprisingly, even though the, the judge is being very picky and is looking at things like one thread hanging down from a hem or a different color blue ribbon in the hair, a lot of squads get an almost perfect score in inspection, which is amazing. Um, every year there's some discussion as to whether inspection really needs to be a part of pom-pom competition. I mean, it's not a performance. I mean, is it, you know, is it really necessary that we include that as a judging category? And every year it's voted on by different members of the organization and it's the squads and the representatives from the squads that want to keep it in. The girls like to do it. They like getting psyched. They like preparing for it. They like having their hair all done exactly the same way if that's what they choose to do. I don't like judging it. I feel, I feel bad staring at these girls and looking for mistakes. I'm, I mean, I've done it and I would do it again, but I'm, I don't really enjoy it. Another reason why a lot of people don't like to do inspection is that they're not actually, the, the judge that's doing that is not actually watching the competition. They don't get to see any of the performances because they're out in another room inspecting the girls before they even go in. As soon as that squad is in, the next one comes out. So that's inspection. I do want to go back because I did forget to mention one thing that's important. The categories, the judging categories is not weighted equally. I mentioned that inspection was worth 20 points, which is the lowest. The two categories that are worth the most points are general effect and routine, and they're both worth 50 points each, so they're real crucial. Um, precision moves in dance and marching and maneuvering are both worth 30. The captain score, which is done separately, is worth 20. Okay, then I'll move into M&M, &M, marching and maneuvering. Uh, the judge that's doing marching and maneuvering is down on the floor rather than on the platform with the other judges holding the clipboard and walking around among the squad while they perform, looking at mostly their feet, their footwork, and how they're getting from one place to another. That's the two kinds of movement from one place to another. They call marching, which, I mean, we know what marching is. There's lots of different styles of marching. Some squads have a signature style. They do one with a real high knee, and some do these strange things where they're running like horses. I mean, there's all kinds of different kinds of marching that they do and maneuvering that's just all the other kinds of ways of getting from point A to point B. You could do dance steps, leaps, run, there's all kinds of things you do. And the judge is looking to see how well the girls are going from place A to place B. Do they know their position in line? Do they know where they're supposed to be going next? Are they getting there in the right way? When they do get in position, whatever the formation is, are they lined up correctly? Um, is the spacing right? Are the girls using the right foot when they're supposed to be using the left foot? And again, on the M&M score sheet, there's a place to tick off for these kinds of mistakes like alignment and spacing. That is a category, again, that I'm not very comfortable judging because there is so much going on. There's so much to see. There's 48 feet. I, I can't see it all, and I feel like I'm missing quite a bit of it. Some judges love it. Um, but it's not the category that I feel most comfortable with. And in fact, I probably will never judge it again because um, I'm much better at some of the other categories. Moving into precision moves and dance. Precision moves are the kind of moves that you probably um, generally think of as being related to pom-poms. Those sharp, um, punchy, snappy moves with the head, arms, feet that are either done in unison or they're done um, in a wave effect throughout the, the squad. Dance, obviously, that's dance moves. Back when I was a pom-pom 15 years ago, and I keep comparing how it was then to how it is now, we were strictly a precision squad. We did not do any kind of dance moves at all, and in fact, I remember there was lots of discussion among the girls that this dance was infecting pom-poms and just ruining it, and we just thought it was terrible. Uh, the art of pom-poms was uh, deteriorating, and it's funny now when I think about it, but now most of the squads do a balance of maybe 50% precision-type moves, 
with dance mixed in, in however they want to design their routine. And in fact, a good routine is now defined as one that has a balance of dance moves and precision moves. The judge that's looking at precision moves in dance is looking at the execution. How well are these kinds of moves being done? Um, are the girls on the right foot? Again, do they know the step? Are they all doing it exactly the same way, which is crucial with pom-poms. The uniformity is the number one thing that they're looking for. Um, if there's a kick line, are all the kicks at exactly the same height? Are the toes, if the toes are supposed to be pointed and they don't have to be, are they all pointed at the same angle? Those are the kind of things that you're looking for with precision moves in dance. There is some overlap in that category with, say, marching and maneuvering. I mean, some of the maneuvering steps are dance steps, and they're going to be looked at in both of those categories. But again, the judge is looking for execution, how it's done, as well as the variety of steps that are put into the routine, how difficult are they to do, how original are they. I like to do that category. That's fun. I have some dance background, and I like looking at those different kinds of things. Um, Another category that's a lot of fun to do is general effect. That's a big one because it's worth 50 points. And a lot of times the squad that has the highest score in general effect is going to be the squad that wins that night. Not always, but generally a high general effect score is going to place you well. General effect means I mean, how all the parts are put together. Is the performance as a whole entertaining? Does the squad know what it's doing? Is it doing it well? Are they giving 100%? Are they peppy when they're supposed to be peppy? Um, I mean, the, the general effect, that's you know, it's not a, sort of self-explanatory. Uh, the judge that, that's looking at general effect is the one that's using the tape recorder, and they have a running commentary from the moment the team starts, um, making comments, po you know, mostly constructive criticism or positive comments, things that they liked, things that they found interesting. And at the end of the competition, that cassette tape becomes um, the property of the squad. So they can listen to it at their next practice when they go over how well they did at the competition. And so that's very important to have. Um, uh, another category that a lot of people don't like to judge but that I enjoy is routine. That is the only category where the judge is not looking at the execution at all. They're not concerned how well the moves are done. They're simply concerned about the choreography. Is it a well-designed routine? Does it have a good balance of different kinds of moves? Is, it, is there good floor coverage? I mean, basically, is the routine well-designed, I mean, well not well-done? Most people don't like judging it because they, they have a hard time separating how well the team is doing with, what, with the choreography. For example, if a squad is really if a squad has a pretty well-designed routine, but they haven't practiced very much and it's not perfected at all, and the unison is off, it's sometimes hard to tell that it's a good routine. But I like that category. I enjoy looking at that. Let me make sure I covered them all. Inspection, precision moves and dance, marching and maneuvering, general effect, and routine. Right? Those are the five main categories. The only one left is captain, and that like I said, that is a separate category. Regardless of how a team does, um, a captain can place first, second, or third herself. The person who's doing the, the judging of captain looks at just that one person in each squad, follows them through the whole routine to see how well they do the routine, do they know their part, and do they do it well. And that, that person gets a score for that. Um, so it's possible that a school that's not doing very well might have a captain that does a good job or vice versa. Usually the very good squads are going to have a good captain as well, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, I like judging that one a lot because it's only one person to look at and it's, I mean, it's, some people think it's boring because you don't get to see the whole routine, you don't get to see the other girls, you don't get the full effect of the ripples or anything like that, but that doesn't bother me because I like to look at just the one person. I find it's relaxing and I can do a good job in that category. I think I covered the basics, but I just wanted to leave with one more comment. And that is that I realized that, that the term is silly, pom-poms. But I'm glad to see that it's becoming a more legitimate high school sport for girls. 
I, I think that the athletic ability and the determination and the hard work that, that goes into pom-poms is equal to the kind that um, is given for soccer, football, or any of the other high school sports. And I'm actually, I find watching pom-pom competition a lot more entertaining than watching a football game. Hi, my name is Mike Sailing. I'm a construction manager for a regional cellular telephone company and I'd like to talk to you today about building a cellular network. What is a cellular network? It's a series of towers, antennas, small radio equipment buildings strategically placed throughout a city transmitting and receiving a cellular signal from your mobile vehicle allowing you to communicate just about anywhere within the coverage area. Cellular, unlike the landline telephone companies, is limited in its coverage areas by the FCC and those boundaries are predetermined in every city. Uh, I'd like to give you a generic overview of the concept of cellular so that we can begin on how we build a cellular network. Uh, I'd like to, for you to envision having two tools. One is a 50 mile radius map of the city in which you live and the other is a stack of octagon shaped cards. This map will be in the scale of one inch equals one mile, and these cards will be eight inches in diameter, which represents eight miles. So on the table, you'll place the map, and then in the center of the map, begin placing the octagon-shaped cards until you have completely covered the map. This will, re this will represent a cell or a coverage area. Each cell is independent and will have its own antenna or tower somewhere in the, in the center of that coverage area. Now the importance of that is that when a phone call is made and a vehicle travels from one coverage area into the next and the signal gets weaker as it leaves one coverage area and it gets stronger as it goes to the next coverage area, the signal is automatically transferred without the caller knowing that that has happened. So in that process, the radio engineers are the next ones to get involved here. With the use of topographical maps, commuter routes, and traffic patterns, they determine where best an antenna might go in that coverage area. And once they've given these coordinates, we employ real estate consultants who go out into the country and try to find property that best suit those uh, uh, longitude and latitude coordinates. And if the real estate consultants have any luck, they come back and they have reached uh, a lease agreement with one of these people, and the zoning process begins. At that time, we prepare a survey, we prepare site plans, we prepare engineering drawings, and we take this to the local jurisdiction, county, city, uh, wherever this property may be located. And the zoning process seems to be the most tedious process that we go through. Uh, it can take anywhere from six weeks to six months and uh, usually uh, it's just a very tedious process and, and some of the problems we've had have been in the high concentrated areas of, um, of cellular use seem to be the most difficult to, uh, to get zoning because the people, uh, we call it the NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard. And I can understand. I don't know that I would want an antenna in the back of my yard either. Uh, so forth, the zoning process becomes very tedious. So having, uh, let's say that we do get zoning approved and uh, we go out and we prepare, the engineers go out and prepare sole borings of the property so that we can uh, begin to engineer the tower foundation and building foundations. And this process can take anywhere from uh, one month to six months, depending on the jurisdiction that you're located in. Once the engineering is complete and we have drawings sufficient to go to the county, city, or uh, jurisdiction that we're applying for, we submit these drawings for their approval to obtain a building permit. At that time, and this process could take anywhere from six hours to six weeks, uh, depending upon the uh, the uh, nature of the drawings, the type of construction, and the jurisdiction. That and once the, the building permit is issued, that's when my job really starts. I'm, giving, uh, I'm given a set of drawings, I'm given a location, and I'm given a time schedule. And time is, uh, is very important in that, that, um, that I get this built 
on time, on budget, and in a timely manner. So the first thing I do is go out, find the site, and begin to uh, develop the site. If there are trees that have to be removed, the trees are removed. If there's a driveway that has to be put in, uh, we excavate and, and put the driveway down. The next part of the process is clearing the land around the site and preparing it for the concrete foundation for the tower. And this, this can be a very tedious process also where, especially in the Atlantic Coastal Plain, we have very sandy soils and the process of drilling 60 and 70 feet into the ground uh, creates quite a mess. And it, it, it's an environmental issue also where the, uh, the mess that I make cannot go out of the bounds of my leased area. So having done this successfully and the tower foundation is complete and I erect my building, we come back in and the tower is erected. And that process usually takes four or five days and uh, it's quite a sight. The, the first time I saw a tower erected I thought, my goodness gracious, the guys look like ants up there and it looks very dangerous, but these guys are professionals and I've been in this business eight years and we've never had a serious accident. So having had the tower erected, the building placed, the driveway in, uh, the next step is the power company, the commercial power company and the telephone company in that area bring their utilities into the site. They get hooked up into the building and the equipment inside is activated the cell site is turned on and another area has cellular coverage. Thank you.